Right, welcome back. So this is lecture two. Why are categories? Is this hard enough? So as I mentioned in the beginning, there are various flavors of higher categories that one may be speaking about. Uh, well, we had some examples like uh, chain complexes and weak equivalences. We also had examples like categories, functors, and natural transformations. Um, and both of them deserve to be called higher category. And now I'll give you a little bit of a crash course of higher categories. I know that some of you already actually know what higher categories are. So again, as before, please feel free to interrupt, um, give comments, extra questions or something like this. Uh, okay, so for the first part, we'll focus on trying to understand what higher category in this style is, and then we'll go here. And then at some point we'll merge the two. So uh, what's a higher category? So the underlying idea or principle is uh, we want to use enriched categories. And I mean, we won't quite, but this would be somehow the guiding principle. We want to model something like an enriched category. So what's an enriched category? So S tensor is a monoidal category. Uh, then definition, an S enriched, category is C consists of, now I'll actually copy a lot of the parts of the definition uh, of a category. So we have objects um, and well, I'll, I'll just deal with small categories overall. Most of the examples, or if we will go to higher categories, usually the small ones are the ones that we can model best. Um, objects. And then M for morphisms. So for every X and Y in the objects, uh, we have now an object. I will call hum c from x, y sitting inside s. Okay, then we have composition. If we have x, y, and z. And now the point is, as opposed to normal composition where I take the Cartesian product here, now I replace this by my monoidal product. So now these two are um, objects in S, which may or may not be sets, right? They could be something completely different. So here I really want to take the tensor product. Okay, and then, well, we also have identities. So this was called C and this was called I. So how do I now phrase what's, uh, what's an identity? So now I have a morphism 
going from the unit object to um, C of XX. So home C of XX, we want to single out something in here, right? But if it's not a set, I can't talk about an element in that set. Rather, this is now a thing in S. So the only thing I can do is I can map into it from my unit. That's singling out something. Okay, so this is called the identity. Uh, and then I won't write it out, but we have associativity. And unitality. So one thing to point out here is in associativity, we have um, how many corners? Five, one, two, three, four, four. Yeah. Uh, so here we have a diagram which must commute. Okay, so that's something just I would like to point out that in both of these cases we have a diagram that should commute. Okay, what are the examples that we will want to have? What are examples for S? So, well, if we just take sets, then we just get categories. Um, Well, that was the boring example. Uh, if we take S being vector spaces with the tensor product, we get linear categories. So these will actually be rather important in Adelian's talks. If we take S being chain complexes, we get DG categories, which you may have seen. Um, but for us now, the more interesting examples will be taking CAT itself with the Cartesian product. Uh, and then, we get what's called a two category. And the second one, which will be important for us is we take top or simply set, either one is fine. Start with top. And then this sometimes goes under the name of topological category, but uh, I want to be a bit more careful and say topologically enriched category. Or we could have taken simplicial set and then we get a simplicial or simplicially enriched category. So that's a very slick definition, very short definition of what two categories is. <clears throat> um, and so the first example, an example of an example, but example of one is taking categories, functors, and natural transformations. So what's the point here? The point is that if you take B and C being categories, and then I can look at what's now my hum from B to C, they're just functors from B to C. This is a category. 
So the objects are functors, as the notation suggests. And the morphisms are the natural transformations. Okay. The same is true if I instead take metamonoidal categories. Maybe variation. That's a notation I had used before. And then I need symmetric monoidal functors and symmetric monoidal natural transformations. And then this is my notation. Okay, so basically this is the only example of a two category I really know. <laughs> Uh, all others actually aren't really two categories, but rather they're bi categories. So, problem uh, for those of you who are watching, um, I wrote here we have a diagram which must commute on the previous board. This will have a star attached to it. <laughs> and so, star, these diagrams. usually don't commute on the nose, but only up to an invertible two morphism. So in the diagrams, if I write down those diagrams, um, the diagram commuting means that two functors agree or two one morphisms agree. But now if I'm in a two category, I have the freedom of asking for those one morphisms not to just agree. One morphism is just a morphism, but rather to have an invertible two morphism between them. And so now, um, well, usually those actually are there. So even, even in the most simplest cases that you can write down, I mean, basically, uh, basically nothing is associative on the nose, but only up to an identification. Okay, so now uh, definition, and I won't write down the details because then I would spend the whole hour just writing out the details, but a by category, is the same data as a two category, but uh, with associativity and unitality replaced by uh, two isomorphisms, uh, two, yes, two isomorphisms. E for every X, Y, Z, and W, uh, X, Y, yeah, maybe I won't write it out. <laughs> I'm not going to do that on the fly. And these two isomorphisms now, which themselves satisfy commutative diagrams. I mean an invertible two morphism. Exactly. So S is cat in this case. So it's an it's a natural transformation. Okay, so maybe this is also a good exercise because writing it out on the board is a bit annoying. Write out the diagrams for the associativity. And 
try to replace the commuting diagram now with a natural isomorphism um, and try to figure out what's possibly what new diagrams could we have. And again, um, this is the something please do come and ask if you get lost. Part of the point of the exercise is to get lost <laughs> because you will see that there's a lot of data that shows up. Okay, now we have more examples. Switching the board. Oh yeah, maybe I should also add uh, that we draw uh, objects in a uh, two or in a by category as points and then morphisms. So one morphisms, these are the objects in a Home. as well as usual as arrows and then two morphisms equals morphisms in a home as something like this so this is a two morphism it's a morphism in a hom. Which hom? The hom from here to here. So this is hom from x to y, and this is x and this is y. <clears throat> so examples of a bi category. First one, I will call Alge. I'll give it a little by. Not a very good name, but uh, yeah. So objects are um, algebras. Over some ground field, then one morphisms. Or let's write it the slow way. What's if I have two algebras? What's my home from A to B? So here my objects are A by objects. And warning, warning in some texts, the A and the B are reversed. And what are morphisms now? So these are what we would call one morphisms. And these will be two morphisms. So what are the morphisms of this home? They are homomorphisms of A, B, bi modules. Uh, right, so challenge, why is this not a category? Try to think, think about that. All right. And two, And um, spans sets. So my objects now be sets. Uh, and a one morphism from X to Y is a pair of maps going from some common source.
Um, nobody asked me what composition is here. So what's composition? So if I have an AB bimodule M and uh, yeah, I wrote them of course the other way. Then this will be defined to be a relative tensor product. And this is still an A C bimodule. So implicitly, we're making a choice here uh, of a choice of relative tensor products. So there's a bit of a subtlety here, right? Uh, in if we take what's called the homotopy category of this thing, we will ta be taking isomorphism classes of these guys, and then this choice disappears. But you can still make this precise. Okay, what about the spans? <clears throat> what composition here? Let me first write down the two morphisms. So here there are different choices we can make, but in this, in this thing here. Uh, so if we have, maybe let me call this S for span. So if we have two of those, then what now is a two morphism? It's again, a pair of maps. That fits in here and make both diagrams commute. But now, actually, we can't just take a pair of maps. We have to take uh, isomorphism classes of. And why is uh, because we want to be able to compose. So what's composition? Where do we want to continue writing? Maybe on the first board. So right now we're really working on this side. We'll get to this one in a moment. Sorry, what do you mean by isomorphism classes of maps in this case? Uh, I haven't told you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, right, so what I can do is I can take Let me write the span a little bit differently. Okay, I will rephrase what's the two morphisms. I will just draw a picture in a different way. I will draw it in this way. Now, if I have another one, that just means that I'm, I'm, I have the same, the same thing here, but now I have a second one and I can ask for a map here. That's an isomorphism. Okay. So this is an isomorphism. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. OK, so what's composition? It's given by taking pullbacks. So if I have my one morphism and another one, Ah, 
Where's the iPad to move things down? <laughs> So now I can take a pull back here. And I better be in a situation where these exist. Okay, so this involves a choice. So I'm mentioning this involves a choice because if you now want to make these things rigorous, you really do have to make these choices and keep track of them and work a lot on these things. Um, you will see, or maybe this is more of a side comment than what we will actually see is that actually when we pass to higher categories in the sense of the other side, it's not so important to choose the composition. But rather there, we have like a lot of different choices, possible choices of composition. But they, what they all have in common is that they're equivalent. That's certainly true for the pullback, right? That's the universal property. So this fact that here we're involves choice of pullback or in the algebras and bimodules, we chose a relative tensor product has actually already a hidden indication that what we're dealing with actually is like an infinity two category. Um, just like a remark, maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but like you mentioned that you sort of do things up to isomorphism when you go up to like sigma and sigma prime, like, could you keep going? Like, could you keep like having like sort of spans of spans almost like sort of Absolutely. Result, this kind of becomes an infinity Absolutely. category. Um, Absolutely. Like, so for everybody, the question was, and this picture maybe suggests it. Well, here we stopped and took isomorphism classes off. Could we instead have continued and added extra layers? And yes, indeed, absolutely. We could have spans of spans of spans of spans. Um, then is infinity n category. So it's actually making precise what an n category is as explicitly as we've been doing here is not that easy. Um, and if you want to read a paper on that uh, with the full infinity n categories, there's a very nice paper by Rune Hauksang, who constructs this as an infinity n category. Any other questions? Okay, great. So what's our main example? We want to get back to boardisms. Ooh, new technology. Okay, our third example, did I not give them numbers? Yes, three is boardisms. And well, I mean, to make things full technical sites, we before already had to work quite a bit. Um, so I won't be able to give you all the details. And if you want all the details, go with the very nice thesis of Chris Gomez. And you will see it takes quite a lot of pages. <laughs> So uh, what are the objects? Yeah, maybe let's just stick to two cob, but now I'll add a little X for the by version. Maybe I should just write by to be consistent with the four, but uh, yeah. So my objects are finite sets of points. So close zero dimensional manifolds, one morphisms. Yeah, maybe I should add here 
informally. So what are one morphism? So I have a one dimensional manifold with boundary together with uh, M together with a diffeomorphism from the boundary of M to my to two parts. So this will be the source. This will be the target. So you see I'm already abbreviating because this should be the definition from before. Already omitting a lot of extra stuff. And then my two morphisms um, are isomorphism classes. of two dimensional bordisms between bordisms. So this is, what is this? This is a two dimensional manifold with corners. So with corners just means it's modeled not on a half space, but rather on a corner. Um, and then here now I'll start maybe adding with some extra stuff. Uh, Yes, which can be embedded into a little square across an R infinity. So let me draw a picture for you. Something like this. So here, the source is front. I'll try to color code it. So this is the source. I only have two colors. And then we have the target is the back. Okay. Are you happy with this? Mm -hmm. So the question is, do I insist that the other two sides that I have here, so the things lying over the other parts of this boundary of the square, are cylinders? Question for the audience, do I? Depends if you want a bi-category um, or a double category. <laughs> uh. Yes. So the <laughs> Reply here was that it should be a bi category as opposed to what we could call a double category. So, yes, I do have to insist that there are dynasties here. Um, and this is note sides, the other two sides. Are cylinders. So this is because my, my picture 
for a two morphism was this and not this. Okay, so I only have a source and a part, and those will be the front and the back. And then on the sides, you should rather think of these as being like an object. So, I mean, if I just have an identity, I can think of it as just being an object. And if you remember, that kind of goes also into this philosophy of you're not really supposed to think of an object as being zero dimensional, but rather as being like a cylinder on something. Okay, so the difficulty in defining this comes now to define compositions. Um, before we had fixed that by using these colors, I did not tell you how to do that here and I won't. Um, feel free to go and read it up and ask questions about that. Um, this is symmetric monoidal. I haven't told you what a symmetric monoidal by category is. In a symmetric one or by category, there are many more diagrams that don't commute on the nose, but only up to something. And it becomes a already quite involved writing things down. Are there any questions? Can you speak up a little? The way I drew it. So the square is this one. And then the R infinity is here. So this is how I will usually draw it. Well, I mean, there will also later be like a base square and then an R infinity part. And this is, that's as many dimensions as I can draw. So <laughs> this, this will be how it is. Gluing becomes more difficult, right? So the nice thing here is I can just patch squares next to each other and then up to a linear rescaling, it's still a square, right? It's up to, exactly. But rescaling just, I mean, I can just take a product of rescalings and that's it. So it's just, I mean, yes, you could absolutely. It's just, it just becomes more complicated to write down. Okay, so I on purpose, I mean, you could replace, put an N here instead, instead of the two, you can, you can do the same thing. Um, but now for the N dimensions, it's kind of unnatural to stop with two layers. Okay, so now we have, basically we have, well, three layers. Okay, so we have the N dimensional things, N minus one dimensional things, N minus two dimensional things. And it's a bit arbitrary to stop there. Why stop, right? You could just go on. And I mean, that's basically the origin, as far as I understand, of trying to build an N category of cobordisms or K category for any K in between. Um, so, I mean, this was a long, long story, has a long history. And I mean, I'll probably get, just give you a, a list of references if you're, if you're curious. And there were many people working on these things. Um, but I mean, already to write down what a symmetric monodal three category is, is pretty much impossible. So symmetric monodal by category, you have a lot of diagrams, but okay, you can write them down. Checking them is a different story. But for a three category, things just become a lot more complicated. And so um, here's a different, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll be using a different approach. Let's put it that way. So this now goes, we'll talk about higher categories in the different um, uh, style. <coughs> so 
But instead of just adding amorphisms up to n and getting an n category, we will try to just add all k morphisms at the same time. I'm crazy. Uh, it was hard to include k morphisms up to some n. Why, why doing it bigger? There were very clever people who figured out that this is actually easier. So let's start with uh, uh, the situation where all k morphisms. are invertible. This will be called an infinity groupoid. So this here says that the infinity in front says we have k morphisms for all for all uh, k. So the idea going back to Grotendieck is the following. So given a space X, topological space, we can associate to it the fundamental groupoid. So objects, are the points in X and the one more the morphisms are class in X. Right? Really? Homotopy classes. And I want you, I want this, I'm, I'm stressing this because I want this to ring a bell, okay? We've been doing this all over. We've taken ISO classes off, Diffio classes off, homotopy classes off, and that should ring a bell. We can also now instead, not take homotopy classes off, but rather um, we just keep paths. And now, well, we can compose. It's not associative anymore, but it's only associative up to a homotopy. Does that ring a bell? What could that be? A category. Yes, but what? A little bit more precisely? By groupoids, I don't know. Um... Yeah, <laughs> it's a bi category. Okay. So, and this will be called two groupoid. So, it's a bi category. So, now in this situation, I delete this, I write one here, and then I add on two morphisms which are now uh, homotopies between paths, right? No, yes, what's the problem? Exactly, now we have to add homotopy classes again. So, <laughs> If you look at the pattern, it's annoying. Always at the top layer, we have to take these homotopies off. Okay. So hopefully, if we continue and we don't do this, but just add on a next layer instead, we get the fundamental infinity groupoid. This will be pi less than or equal to two. Um, 
here. And if you look at this picture, hopefully that reminds you a little bit of the bygone that we had up at the board before. <clears throat> okay, well, I don't know. I mean, I said I wanted to find infinity groupoid, right? And now I wrote down, well, there should be an infinity groupoid. We still don't have a definition. So what somehow the, the hypothesis here is, we turn this into a definition. So the homotopy, hypothesis an infinity groupoid is a space so here what i really mean it's it's a homotopy type Um, so really to make these things technically precise, we have to start talking about things like model categories or the infinity category of these things. Um, we really want to identify here homotopy types, so topological spaces up to homotopy. Okay. We have homotopic spaces, they will have homotopic fundamental groupoids, two groupoids, and so on. All right. So this is our definition now. An infinity group, but it's just a space up to weak equivalence. Questions? I, I've been a little bit um, like- Just a second, there's one in the audience. Oh, sorry. <laughs> mm. Ultimately, we would like to be able to prove this, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> hmm? exactly, that's the problem, right? So, that's, so I mean, in the beginning, um, up to like for this level or for that level, there is something you can prove. So what you can actually prove is that if we have a homotopy one type, so something just with pi naught and pi one, and then we look at groupoids, that there's an equivalence there. If we do the same for two homotopy two types, something was just pi naught, pi one, pi two, then uh, those can be exactly modeled by two groupoids. There's an equivalence there, equivalence of model categories. So ideally, if we have uh, a definition of the side, we want this to actually be a theorem and not an hypothesis or a definition. So you can also say it as, you know, somebody comes and says, I have a definition of infinity category, <laughs> like infinity group, right? This is the thing that you will want to test it against. Yes. Yes. Exactly. That's that's exactly that's exactly the point. We don't have one, <laughs> right? So that's why I'm saying we turn this hypothesis into a definition. Right, but if somebody else comes along and says, hey, I have a definition of infinity groupoid, this is one way to test the definition. It will tell you this is only a good definition if there's an equivalence um, given this way. But say, I mean, if somebody comes and says, I have a definition of free groupoid, I mean, this is like very concrete. All right. <laughs> well, I don't have a better definition than the homotopy hypothesis or a different definition than the homotopy hypothesis. 
Do you? I mean, I. Yes, but I mean, that's that for me is already a top. I mean, for me, a con complex is a space. So, yes, it's too tautological. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, of course, if you if you want to stay with topological spaces um, on the one side and then you can say a con complex, well, those model categories are equivalent. So that is a definition. But yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is something to prove there, but I asked if people were familiar with spaces are con con uh, simplicial sets <laughs> or something like this in the in the questionnaire, and it sounded like everybody was familiar with it. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, okay, we come to be types, yes. <laughs> Was there another question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I can't hear when people like are asking questions in the audience. So I didn't want to like interject. Um, but did you have another question? No, that was my question. That okay, was, great. Was yeah. <laughs> so also you guys, please do remind me if I don't repeat the questions from the audience. Um, I want everybody to be able to hear. <laughs> okay, great. So if everybody's happy with that so far, we'll get back to con complexes and things like that. Um, oh, I only have three minutes left. Uh, okay, so let's make a short definition. So now we can try to define infinity one category. So what do these two numbers mean? This here means we have K morphisms for all K. And this here means that for K greater than one, the K morphisms are invertible. And so what we have in an infinity one category uh, is certainly for fixed objects x, y. So let this be c. We certainly want to have something like a hum. Um, but now, <laughs> What are the things in, in HOM? If you think, well, objects are just the morphisms, the one morphisms, but what are now the one morphisms in the HOM? They were the two morphisms in the original thing. So these are already invertible. So this here is an infinity groupoid. I.e. by our homotopy hypothesis, A space. So definition attempt one an infinity one category is a category enriched. In spaces. So this is a perfectly good definition. Just as two categories was a perfectly good definition. But we have the same problem here that we have for two categories. It's too strict. 
So if we have this enriched in, we again have associativity on the nose. But in many examples, we already saw with by category, two categories and by categories, we have the same problem here that many examples just won't be that strict. Okay. So we won't have associativity on the nose, but only up to a higher morphism again, just like before. Uh, which is why, I mean, if we find an example, which is that great, awesome, like we're very happy, more than happy, right? But some examples of infinity one categories that we want to have just don't form this. Yeah. Um, no, I think I'm trying to parse what you're saying. But... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's equivalent to one, namely the one with one point. Yeah, but like it's still saying like going from X to Y is different than X to Y to X. So you're telling me you want the group void. I'm on board one, right? You want the following infinity group void. You have a point and another point. So these are my objects. And then my morphisms are this one and that one, right? But you have no relation between those paths. But this, this is invertible, right? So this also goes in the other way. And there's also, mm -hmm. okay. They are invertible to each other. They are inverses to each other, okay. But, uh, and, but this here as an infinity group word will be equivalent to just a point, right? Even as categories already, they're equivalent as categories, as group words. Uh -huh. yeah. This is called the walking isomorphism. It's actually a really important one. We'll see it reappear uh, in the next few days. I'll, I'll already give it a name. <laughs> this is actually a very important example. So these are actually equivalent as categories or also as group words. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's why I'm saying like the homotopy hypothesis is now what we will build upon. We will actually forget about, you know, this hypo hypothetical definition, <laughs> abstract definition, and use the other side instead. And there we know what equivalences are. They're just the weak homotopy equivalences. Ah. I apologize. Yes, thank you. Uh, the question was, uh, don't we need a notion of equivalence of infinity group voids as well? And uh, so if we think about the board before where we had the homotopy hypothesis, there were spaces and there were this hypothetical definition of infinity group void without saying it's a space. So yes, we would need a definition of what's an equivalence of infinity group voids there. But that's why we don't touch that side. We just stay on the other side. We use the homotopy hypothesis. We say an infinity group is a space, and there we know what equivalences are, namely weak homotopy equivalences.
there was a comment I wanted to make before, but I think I forgot. So maybe <laughs> this is a good place to stop. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> Yes. Yes. So the question was um, about this ca higher category of spans. So the way I had defined the span by the choice was to have one morphisms or spans, and then after that, the two morphisms are again spans. But instead, we could have just asked for a morphism at the top level. And so um, it was pointed out that uh, um, monads in uh, this latter version are just categories, where monoids are in that thing are just categories, whereas in the other thing, they are related to two Siegel sets. So actually, if you look at the, the book of Dickerhoff and Kapranov, this is made very precise there. But there's also work in that direction by other people. So there's um, Walker Stern also worked on this. Runa Hauksing also has a paper. Um, Joachim, you probably know this better than me. <laughs> yeah, OK, good. Am I missing somebody? I think those are the two main sources that I know. Any other questions? Yeah. Did the people on the Zoom hear that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No. No. Do you want the microphone? <laughs> Sorry, it was just a comment that there are algebraic definitions of infinity groupoids. And for one of them, namely the definition of Batanin, uh, Denis Charles Sisinski actually proved the, the hypothesis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's something I'm not so familiar with, so thanks. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, then I think we'll resume tomorrow. Should I hit stop? Um, yeah, yeah. Already... I think it wanted to do something up there. Uh,